I'd like to throw in the first question for all of our panelists. Maybe give you guys three to five minutes each to tell us more about yourselves. Maybe what does the twin green and digital transition mean to you? What role your organization plays in the transition and what are its actions? So maybe three to five minutes for your opening statements. Let's start with uh, Dr. Ming Tan. Of course, interesting because Dr. Ming Tan um, will give us an outside looking in perspective. Uh, we know that the Good for Tech Institute is a think tank launched by Grav, which is quite interesting because transportation is a big emitter, a greenhouse gas pollutant. So go ahead, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody. And let me just share a little bit about the Tech for Good Institute. We're really delighted to be here in Manila. It's actually only our second anniversary this month. Um, and we are a nonprofit entity. We were founded uh, just in 2021. We are seed funded by Grab. Um, we've also in the past uh, year been funded by Australian National University and uh, the Singapore government. And I will share some research about some of that work that we have done. The reason why we were founded was really to think about what's the development, adoption, and governance of digital technology and technology-enabled business models so that the promise of technology may be leveraged for inclusive, sustainable and equitable growth in Southeast Asia. Um, so yes, transport is an emitting sector, but sometimes the bigger solutions can lie in some of the, you know, where the problems are, right? Uh, and we're really happy to be here with PIDS. Um, and I really think that this conference purpose is so important uh, to promote public awareness of policy research. And that really aligns with what we do at the Tech for Good Institute, because before we make any policy recommendations, the first thing we think is to raise public understanding of tech issues and tech governance issues. And then after that, contribute to the conversation with research. Um, as you mentioned, I'm not from Philippines, so I cannot speak about the Philippines, but let me share with you some things that we've been seeing across Southeast Asia. This piece of research was done, um, sponsored by the Singapore government. And they wanted to know across the public, private and civil sector in six countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. What are they thinking about the next phase of digital transformation? And very top line is that there is this real shift in thinking about the impact of digitalization. Digitalization has obviously um, produced incredible economic and social benefits, uh, but the governments are also grappling with all of the unintended consequences. Um, cybersecurity, rising inequity, environmental challenges. This, the panel before talked about the carbon impact of ChatGPT, for example. So there's this, you know, in the early 1990s, they had this thing called move fast, break things, just do it. And that's really giving way to a new paradigm where companies are called upon to account for their products and services and be responsible, and then to beneficially impact society and the environment. So in other words, tech for good rather than tech, tech for growth rather than tech for good or economic growth to sustainable development. Um, and just very quickly, there needs to be innovation, um, innovation at the technology level, at the business model level, and also at the policy and regulatory model, because things are moving so fast. And there needs to be policy learning along the way to be able to develop fit for purpose um, policy. And then the second part is you can have innovation, you can have the best ideas, but if it's not going to be adopted at scale, you don't get impact at scale. So you need to have a trusted adoption, not blind trust, not the please trust me, I've got a great product, but really a whole of society approach to resilience. Um, so things like digital infrastructure and connectivity and literacy and being able to build the capability of populations to embrace and benefit from the technological advancements is really important. Just in short, the main thing that we're basically seeing is that governments across the country, uh, across the region, 
are seeing that economic growth is crucial, but it's definitely not enough. Um, and the consequences of growth in the digital economy uh, has to be managed in a more proactive manner, such as with this conversation of digitalization and what it can also achieve from a sustainability perspective, if we're going to realize that inclusive, equitable and sustainable future for Southeast Asia. All right, thank you, Dr. Tan. What about you, uh, Dr. Adolfo? Um, a few minutes to talk to us about the organization you represent, the objectives and what are the actions. I wonder, how do you bootstrap a sustainable future for tourism? That's the buzzword these days. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mimi. Good afternoon, good afternoon to everyone. So my name is uh, Twinkle Rodolfo and I'm with uh, Dr. Andrew L. Tan Center for Tourism based here in the Asian Institute of Management. So I'm also joined by my colleagues here, Dr. Rivera and uh, Professor Ayla Gutierrez. And um, the center is actually um, advocating for sustainable tourism. So it's a center for sustainable tourism. And this sustainable tourism actually is anchored, of course, on the three uh, Ps. We have um, people, planet, and prosperity, or others call it um, um, profit. And um, the center is heavily uh, focused on conducting research. Um, and um, actually, the, the team has published quite a number of works, uh, both in the local and in international um, um, arena. And um, we have been conducting uh, trainings and capacity building with the local government units and also enterprises. So we've actually run programs on designing sustainable tourism, um, not just for destinations, but also for enterprises. And um, one of the key reasons why we focus also on enterprises is because if you look at the data, most especially the recent, I think, publication of the Philippine Statistics Authority, um, the 2021 uh, listing of establishments, you will see that about 99%, at least 99% of the enterprises or establishments in tourism are micro, small, and medium enterprises. And even if you look at the employment, that's at least about 96%. So, um, and these enterprises are the ones that actually do not have much resources, for example, to really uh, pursue, um, let's say, this twin transition, digital transformation, and greening, because it requires a lot of resources. But if you look also at the, the, the data, the 5.7 million um, workers employed in tourism, um, that's actually a very um, significant number. So that's about uh, 30, 13.6% of them of the national employment in 2019 before COVID-19 uh, pandemic happened. But what is very interesting is that um, based on the study of the IMF in 2021, at least 60% belong to the informal sector. And you have at least about at least 50% 50, 50 uh, women so belonging to the marginalized uh, and vulnerable sectors of the, of the economy. And so um, if we are to become successful in this uh, transition, first on digital transformation, we really need to bring this, um, this um, very substantial number of our workers belong to the informal sector and in the MSMEs into the fold, meaning for them to become not just aware, but really be equipped to handle the challenges of digital transformation because it's not easy. You have enterprise owners uh, doing everything you know, in, their, um, in their establishments, in their businesses. At the same time, if you look also at the numbers that um, in the, our uh, tourism industry, we have a coastal economy. And um, based on that, um, tourism, coastal tourism and recreational activities, where most of the environmental impacts actually happen, they account for, um, they rank third to, I think, um, fisheries and manufacture of um, fishery products in terms of contribution to the coastal economy at GDP. And uh, we're looking at about at least 689,000 Filipinos whose livelihoods depend on the sea, on the, the ocean economy. And these are very vulnerable communities. So if we can find a way for digital transformation to enable them to become more resilient in their livelihoods and also to allow them to use this digital app, smart apps, to become more resilient 
you know, in the face of the impacts of climate change, then I think we can make a, a big difference. And in the center, we're actually working also closely with um, establishments. In fact, one of them is the Newport World Resorts in promoting the I Love Earth um, program because uh, we recognize that by within the establishments enterprises, we can do a lot of things and in order to uh, by using digital or um, yeah, digital transformation you know sensors etc to reduce the cost of operations to make everything um, efficient so that's actually what we're trying to um, work on we're, we're quite busy nowadays with that thank you you do sound very busy dr twinkle on a more personal uh, level may i know how how much of the country you've traveled and you've seen personally 50%, 75% of the Philippines? Because you're into tourism. Yes, but I've not really covered the, you know, all the <laughs> 7,000 plus 100 islands. But I know that uh, and I've seen very beautiful places. And if we are really to connect and make growth, tourism growth more inclusive, mm -hmm. we really need to use you know, this twin transition so that they can be part of the, the business of or this tourism value All chain. Right. All right. Thank you, Dr. Twinkle. Um, Alex, hi. Good to see you. Hi, um, Alex, PricewaterhouseCooper, I, I know that you guys released your maiden sustainability report this March that was covering fiscal year 2022. So Go ahead. This, the floor is yours. Yeah. So, Just a bit uh, of a background. Alex Cabrera here from uh, PwC. I am uh, the ESG leader of the firm, um, and maybe because of that, I'll be talking from another slightly different uh, angle. You know, uh, when we did this uh, survey among CEOs, they came up with one formula, which is very, very basic, uh, which but I think is very important. The key to success is ensuring short-term profit while managing your long-term goals. And that refers to uh, sustainability. In fact, um, if in the same um, survey, the CEO said that they don't think they will survive. Majority of the CEO said they, will, they think they will not survive in the next 10 years. And at least 40% of them said they will not survive in the next six years if they do not change their business model. And what is this business model all about? Uh, green and digital, certainly, but I'd like to classify the green um, on the environment side, the digital on the governance side, because these are uh, tools that help um, your business um, en enhance and uh, innovate. Uh, the third one is, is, I think the trend is becoming more and more important, the social side, the building of the social uh, capital. That's why there's a talk about even shared prosperity nowadays among the initiatives that we're, we're doing. Um, you talk about the environment. It cannot be environ about the environment per se or being digital to be innovative. It has to be for something. And ultimately, when we talk about the environment or important tools such as you know, digital tools, we're actually talking about human rights, human welfare, improving the quality of life. And that is a very significant portion of the ESG. The social for me uh, puts uh, everything uh, together. Um, this is uh, so important, but the topic is so important that uh, the other day I attended, uh, I made a reaction to the proposed PENCAS bill, uh, the Philipp establishing the Philippine ecosystem uh, for, and, um, for natural capital. Um, so what they're doing is trying to um, gather all this data to see where all the natural resources of, of, the, of the country is and putting this as part of uh, national capital. That is actually a very good initiative because you have to start with something, monitoring uh, what you have in your inventory. But we know that the problem is so much more than that. And the digital side can, can, uh, can really help. Um, if there is no execution, then we're just talking about you know beautiful words, you know like like go green and go digital. But for the for the common uh, for common person, they, they couldn't care less if they don't have the resources to go green or or go digital. Take the case for instance of MSMEs. Uh, their understanding of uh, of green is you know manage their trash and maybe um, don't throw plastic. And I'm just so I'm not trying to put down anybody, but the country is 98% more 
micro and, and small enterprises. So you know that I'm talking about really small uh, businesses as well. And when you talk about digital in so far as they are concerned, we're talking about digital payment system like availing of GCash and, and the sort. But I, I, later on, I'll, I'll discuss what, what, can, uh, what can help them. But in, in this journey, we are on different uh, levels. And the good that the big companies and listed companies are doing um, can be negated if the rest of the companies uh, in the country will not be um, following the same uh, journey. Uh, for example, a listed company can be totally green, but the supply chain isn't. Uh, the listed companies can be totally ethical, but the supply chain is not. Now, what good will that do to the country? And, and I think that that responsibility of big companies requiring the rest of their supply chain to comply um, is really challenging because it will bring up cost and that will also deflate some of their short-term profits. But that, I believe, is the only way to go for us to be uh, entirely sustainable. All right. Um, before we get to BSP Deputy Director Alex, I want to go back to what you mentioned earlier, the Philippine CEO survey for 2023. I actually went over the report and I tried to do a bit of a statistics. Um, climate change was mentioned, guess how many times in that report? Zero. There was no word green in the report. The word technology was mentioned three times. Sustainability was mentioned once, and it was referring to public-private partnerships. From an outsider's perspective, what are we supposed to get? What's the message here? Well, I can, I can give you an outsider's or, well, uh, uh, other stakeholders perspective on this. 54,000 workers were surveyed by PwC in 48 countries across the Asia Pacific. And this is what they said. 40% uh, of their employers um, believe that climate change is important or the climate initiatives are important, which means 60% they don't care. Um, well, 40% uh, wow. uh, um, or... 40% are saying they have initiatives on climate change, which means 60% they don't have any initiative on climate change. But, you know, just going around talking to CEOs and, and, and businessmen, when you, when you hear, and I, I get disappointed when I hear it, when you hear, you know, I'm not going to give any clues, top business people telling you that, you know, we're just a rounding error in the net zero you no know, carbon emission. I mean, we, we wouldn't I make hear a, that a lot too. <laughs> and then, you know, we're, we're a rounding error. But, you know, when, when do you begin to uh, play your part? Okay. And uh, when do you begin not being part of the problem, being part of the solution? All right. All right. We'll leave it at that. Um, BSP Deputy Director uh, Devera Ma'am, BSP also released in July this year your inaugural sustainability report. So go ahead. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you. Um, hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rodora Brazil de Vera from the Supervisory Policy and Research Department. So our group actually handles, aside from other supervi supervisory policies um, governing uh, the operations of banks, we also handle the development of policies on sustainable finance and also collaboration with um, with counterpart regulators, both here and abroad, and also on with relevant government agencies. Um, I think um, the 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 this year's um, this the conference theme is, um, is highly relevant, and also our panel um, sessions topic disruptions on trade and industry. Um, what really comes to my mind is actually the essence. MSMEs, so digitalization, sustainability, MSMEs. These are actually the three areas that are also um, um, one of the, um, that belongs to the top agenda of the BSP. In fact, um, digitalization and sustainability are one of our strategic objectives, and this closely intertwines with the our financial inclusion agenda, which, of course, the MSMEs as it at its heart. So um, we, rec um, 
we recognize this twin transition that it can bring um, immense opportunity for the financial sector, but we are also mindful of the um, uh, potential and intended consequences to businesses, particularly to the small and medium enterprises. And that's why uh, we are pursuing objectives um, based on these individual strategies that we have and also at the same time benefit the, the vulnerable sector. And for instance, we have um, the BSP leads the implementation of the national um, strategy for financial inclusion. So one of the key desired outcome there is the um, promotion of, the sust of a sustainable financing ecosystem targeting the MSME start Ops, and also the agriculture sector. So where the initiatives are aimed at um, reducing the risk and cost so that we can still uh, provide financing to the MSME. So we think that we can do this through policy interventions, um, um, providing innovative financing mechanism and also addressing some demand, demand side barriers. Second is on the digital transformation roadmap, which we launched um, in October 2020. So um, we have issued policies that are key enablers for digital transformation and also for financial inclusion. It was in December 2020 when we released the framework for digital banks. So we now have um, um, six digital banks uh, licensed by the PSP. So they are the ones stopping the, the, the households. So, um, and then we also have the open finance framework and the regulatory sandbox. So this um, welcomes innovative um, te technology solutions, of course, within a controlled environment. And then lastly, um, we have released in December 2022 the 11-point strategy of the BSP under the Sustainable Central Banking Program. So this characterizes or reflects the roles, the varied roles of the BSP as an enabler, mobilizer, and doer in terms of championing the sustainability agenda within the financial system. And of course, one of our um, strategy there is the promotion of inclusive green finance, having the MSMEs in, the mind, in our mind. Of course, uh, the one that you mentioned earlier, the sustainability report of the BSP, it is also one of our actions points, one of our deliverables, quote-unquote, and then uh, that that outlines our initiative so far, the governance. Uh, it's actually a tone from the board, from the monetary board, and also, uh, and it's supported by actually um, uh, members of the BSP um, from different units. So, you know, BSP is a big agency, and we are, how many employees do we have? So, we need a uh, uh, full force to really uh, um, roll out this sustainability, uh, sustainability agenda, not only within the financial system, but also within our organization. Thank you. Director, is it true that um, some companies are having a hard time taking out loans from big banks when the project is a coal plant? Is it true? Um, first, um, we should be mindful of the economic activity in the country. So um, in our regulations, uh, we, we encourage the banks to revisit their strategies, their business models, following, of course, the sustainability principles that they will adapt. And, and in our regulations, we encourage them to increase progressively their loan targets to green or sustainable finance because of course um, given our our also circumstances domestic circumstances and we do not say that um, they bank should um, the risk um, companies because from financing because this will have um, um, an impact also to the MSMEs which form part of the supply chain. So we, they, are, they can finance, but they should have um, justification or a policy that, what, that support this um, decision. It was a listed power company that said that. They were having a hard time taking out loans for a coal project. Speaking of power, Asak Marasiga and your boss, Energy Secretary Popolotilia, has time and again constantly said this thing. He says... 
um, any green transition, especially for a developing country like the Philippines, needs to be a just transition and should not transfer the burden of climate transition to an already overburdened Philippine population. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, that was the statement of our secretary. That means that we need support. If anyone or everyone wants us to really complete and go into a full transition, then uh, we Filipinos cannot do it alone. We have, uh, but we want to ensure that based on our mandate, we will deliver and we will ensure that our electricity, energy, the whole of energy, including its services, will be based on our mantra. Secure, uh, it should be stable, it should be sufficient, it should be reliable, it should be sustainable, and most importantly, it should be reasonably priced and affordable to consumers. So you have mentioned earlier that we target, no? the Philippine Energy Plan targets uh, 50% of renewable energy contribution by 2040. Yes, uh, we are targeting that by 2040, and we are even adjusting it. No? We are crafting now the updated uh, Philippine Energy Plan. It's still the same numbers that you will see, but uh, the greatly increased demand will actually dictate how much renewable we can take in. That means rather than pegging it at 50%, by 2050 rather than 2040, we're looking at greater than 50% renewable by 2050. And how to achieve that, that is what the department is doing at the moment. We're looking at all avenues on how we can achieve first 35% by 2030, and then how shall we move forward going into 2050, which we target, it should be more than, not 50, but more than renewables. So with today's themes that we are, we are supposed to go green and digital, we're not only supporting all the industries going green and digital, the energy sector is adapting itself towards green and digital transformation. Thank you. All right, um, so that's the first round. Hopefully we all know them a little bit better. We have 30 minutes left. So for those who have questions, please do raise them. We're gonna try to address as many questions as we can. So let's now, let me first uh, throw in the second round. Uh, for the second round of questions, I wanna start with um, Dr. Tan, uh, Tech for Good Institute. Um, what does it take to develop a tech ecosystem for good? I mean, what sort of important partnerships are there between maybe platforms and MSMEs? Because MSMEs are the backbone of this economy, not just for the Philippines. I was surprised for Southeast Asia, there are around 71 million. That's 97% of all establishments. So it's not a Philippine case story. It's the region's story. So what sort of partnerships are important and how do you build a tech ecosystem for good? Thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for that question. And um, whilst we look at, I mean, I think the first question that we have to ask is what does good mean? Because quite often who gets to define good gets to define the outcomes. So the first issue we always say is that the definition of good has to be inclusive to begin with. Um, and that means that the government, civil societies, academia, um, and the private sector have to come together to align outcomes. When we align outcomes, we can then say, well, these are the areas that we're going to lean into. Um, and one issue when it comes to this twin transition is that many countries have a digitalization roadmap and, many, and some countries have a sustainability roadmap or a net zero roadmap. And quite often they don't reference each other. And one of the things that we're really sort of working with and having conversations is how do you actually achieve both at the same time? Um, because in a way, the digitalization roadmap is not an end in itself. It's to define, is to achieve whatever good outcomes that you want. 
So to be able to do that, the way we think about it is we have to have sustainable digitalization, which is as um, I think uh, you mentioned where the energy sector is actually one of the industries which has been extremely proactive in bringing on board um, efficiency, sensing technologies, etc., to be able to mitigate and manage all of its negative impacts, as well as the digital economies. I think, Alexander, you talked about the CEO survey. When we talked to digital economy companies, uh, we looked at over 400 across Southeast Asia. 85% of them um, did say the words. They did express interest in or intention towards sustainability goals, but only about half of them had actually done anything about it, right? So, um, an environment was a complete blind spot. When they said they've done something about it, they're doing things that governments are pressing them to do. Think about cybersecurity, think about data protection. And so when there is a whole of society requirement behind, it's pushing the private sector in the right space. You asked about the innovation ecosystem. The other way to think about it is, well, it's not just sustainable digitalization we need, but we need digital sustainability. And what I mean by that is that we can't achieve our goals doing the same, doing it in the same way. You need digitalization to improve efficiency, as, as you mentioned, um, to be able to reduce vulnerabilities that you know that we mentioned, or be able to create whole new markets. And then that's where an innovation ecosystem only takes root and has impact when there is an adoption at mass scale around it. So if we think about the carbon market, for example, that's a whole new market that we are creating at the moment. It didn't exist before. And so you need to have um, trusted and verifiable data to have a carbon market. If I'm going to I don't know, buy an offset, either where I'm a huge company or if I'm an individual buying an offset for my flight. When I pay that money, how do I know it's actually going anywhere? You need that trustable. So you have great technologies, LIDAR, for example, for carbon stock monitoring, uh, estimates on carbon yield, for example. How do you have trusted carbon credits? That's digitalization that's supporting sustainability goals. Um, and I think at the end of the day, the private sector, and when I say private sector, I mean the companies, startups, and investors have to come together to work with government. If you have the aligned goals, there are many ways to the how. You know, we all agree on the why. There are many ways in each of our different roles to be able to push the how, right? The governments are the, the government is really important because they are creating the environment to align outcomes, whether from a policy perspective, regulatory perspective, incentives, for example, but the companies can actually bring solutions to market, um, sometimes faster and at a much greater pace. Um, and then you need also, if you're going to try to do new things, you need to also have the academia, the tech transformation, the tech translation units to be able to bring great ideas into products that can commercialize. So it takes all of these different people, cross-disciplinary, different ways of thinking. Dr. Tan, I'm very curious, what has been the most controversial policy recommendation from Tech for Good Institute? Something we'll remember you by. So I, I'm not sure if it's controversial, but I think one of the things which um, is a new way of thinking is the need for policy innovation. And what I mean by that is it took 75 years for the telephone to reach 100 million users. It took threads by Meta five days to reach 100 million users. So when you have that scale and that pace, you then have how do you make policy when the impact is so great so quickly and you don't really understand even sometimes the technology that happens around it? So I think, I think it was the BSP, my friend from BSP who mentioned regulatory sandboxes, for example, regulatory sandboxes working together with industry to have governance mechanisms through industry associations, for example. How do we close that gap 
between um, knowledge, information, and data that sometimes today is sitting in the private sector more than in the public sector? How do you create those areas, opportunities to learn, and then be able to govern technology and its impacts in ways which are complementary to policy making that can maybe be a little bit faster, can be a little bit more iterative. So I think that's an area which governments that we have spoken with across Southeast Asia 6 are extremely excited about and interested to learn. And then the last thing, the reason why you need policy innovation is if you think about, oh, the, the internet was created effectively through, you know, with, with NASA research at the beginning. The reality is over the last three decades, public spending on R&D has, has plateaued, but it has tripled in the private sector. And so you have privately funded R&D. So you need to have that open conversation between the private and public sector to be able to create great policy that is balances the um, need to protect society and protect national interest, and yet still create the enabling environment for innovation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tan. You mentioned um, BSP earlier, so we go to Deputy Director Devera now. Um, Director, how are you, how are banks helping green MSMEs? How are you guys helping foster green entrepreneurship so we all build back better? greener and more sustainable. Are there special programs to help MSMEs in this transition? Because these are companies that are small, these are smaller players who face expertise and capacity gaps, who have much shorter runways, considered oftentimes higher risk borrowers. Um, banks, um, they, of course, they play an important role in, in providing the financing for this um, type of entities, but they also have to um, equip themselves. They should understand the risks that they are facing and also the, the effectively managing those risks. And the BSP um, provides an enabling environment, um, providing the risk management guidance to this bank so that they can manage their risk effectively. They can understand the risk, uh, manage the risk, and then that's the time that they can, um, should I say, design programs for this type of um, 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 groups or businesses, given the, the inherent high risk involved. But as I mentioned earlier, there are also um, initiatives of the BSP to provide financing to this um, vulnerable group, the MSMEs. And also during the pandemic, um, we have provided actually um, reliefs or incentivized banks so that they can extend the same relief or benefit to this um, to um, to this to the MSMEs, and some of those reliefs are still standing at the moment, and so that we will not um, just abruptly cut the financing to this type of entities. But on the demand side, I think. Um, we need to also, well, it takes a multi-stakeholder collaboration to actually um, increase awareness of our um, MSMEs on the environmental issues, on the digitalization opportunities. And we need to um, support them in, and capacitate them so that they can increase also their resilience. Thank you. Yeah, because a Tech for Good Institute report from 2021 showed 60% of MSMEs said they were unable to obtain loans uh, from traditional financial institutions. So there's a very big gap there. Um, you mentioned whole of society approach. Attorney Alex, what do you think? Do you think the private sector should lead the charge here? I, I know it's public-private partnership, but who takes the bigger end? Well, the private sector will uh, will always be the uh, main force uh, behind it. But you know, just commenting on that earlier question, because I know something, uh, the DTI with the uh, National Development Corporation, they're um, trying to, well, I think they already have, they're just harnessing this platform for use of MSMEs to help them 
uh, have an e-commerce uh, presence. Oh, that is wonderful if uh, if they don't charge for it. And I think I don't think they will. Uh, they've uh, uh, con consulted me on uh, you know what what can be done about that. I hope it really happens. It really pushes through because it's like magic. You know, it's uh, it's what the MSM is. Uh, the micro and the small need, you know, the medium, they can even uh, pay for that uh, already. But the small ones, as I said, they only have this uh, Gcash, uh, sorry for mentioning uh, Gcash, the payment. <laughs> Not platforms. a paid ad. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily. Yeah. No, the uh, private sector, uh, the public-private partnership, certainly. But I think it's going to be out of compulsion more, more than anything else. Mm. Uh, and I can explain. Like, for instance, the Code of Corporate Governance applicable to uh, publicly listed corporations. You, there's, a, there's a list of uh, things there that they're required to do, including sustainability reporting. Now, you would say that uh, sustainability reporting is not a requirement on non-listed companies or uh, corporations uh, not vested with public interest. But there's something going on, and maybe in 2024, it's going to come out. Uh, it's being crafted by the Philipp uh, Philippine um, uh, Sustainability Reporting uh, Committee uh, created by the PRC and the Board of Accountancy. And what, what this is doing is it's trying to tailor the global um, sustainability reporting uh, requirements to the local uh, setting. Now, that includes a report on climate uh, impact of the business. Um, so imagine if every corporation will be required to disclose the climate impact of their business, that's a very important start because without transparency, there's no accountability. And if, if I can add to that, one of my aspirations is for private corporations to report their impact on the natural um, assets or the uh, environment in terms of what, were, what are the natural resources that they're using in order to um, create their product. And there's a PwC study, in fact, that more than 50% of the global GDP relies on natural resources. Can you imagine that? That we can actually deplete everything in, in a few decades if we're not able to regenerate, if we're not able to account. And we're talking about green and digital. Maybe for us, that's not even our problem because we can survive this. We can finish everything and we can survive it. So everything that we're talking about here is actually referring to the next generation and their and their children. That that is really the main purpose of because if it's just our survival, we're good. So <laughs> <laughs> this is actually for posterity. For the for the next attorney Alex, the reporting um, will that cover privately owned companies or just listed companies? No, no, that that's for everybody. So that's going to be. Um, uh, required disclosure in the notes to financial statements. For I don't know all, if ultimately they will accept. Can the it. small companies afford it? No, the, the reporting is the uh, you're required to report your climate impact, right? And there will be guidance on how to report your mm. climate impact. You know, just like just like how there are guidance on how to report your uh, fixed asset or your property, plant, and equipment, how you depreciate it, uh, etc. Mm. So there will be something like that. Guideline. But in relation to climate uh, impact, um, there are a number of laws that's compelling it uh, as well, like the Expanded Producers Responsibility mm -hmm. Act that requires you to account for the plastic that you put out, collect them, and then uh, there's a certain schedule in, in, in the law on um, how much you're, you're supposed to collect from the environment. And the first phase is for large companies only. So that's the sad part. Anyway for large companies only. So this is a law compelling companies to be part of the um, solution. Mm -hmm. But this is not a law that compels companies not to be part of the problem. If you are, I'm sure you can collect, and apologies to my clients, they're not here, but uh, in, in, with, with all objectivity and all good faith, I say, I'm sure they'll be able to collect the trash. You know, because they have the means and they have the dedication mm -hmm. to do that. But can you have the right R&D, you know, to stop the sachet economy, you know, to, to go into refilling or, or whatever works, you know, do you, do you have the right investments, the sufficient investments R&D to, to have a packaging that uh, decomposes uh, 
for instance. Okay. And, and this is something that they are probably they're putting effort into that, but they're not yet there. And that is why I'm saying they are ready to be part of the solution. They will comply with the EPR. Mm -hmm. you know, but so long as you're trying to solve the problem you're also creating. That's, it, that's, it really that's, requires a whole of nation approach. If I may share, I was talking to a big printing company the other day, and they were sharing, you know, you know the, the straps, the bands that you wear around your arm when you attend concerts? They're made of a material called Tyvek. They're supposed to be 100% recyclable. Recyclable, eco-friendly. What's the problem? They're recyclable elsewhere, not here, because we don't have the facilities to recycle. Sayang naman. Um, you know how when you cater to multinational companies, they require you, if you want to print for them, to use so-called FSC certified paper. It's a Forest Stewardship Council certified paper. It means the paper was sourced sustainably. There was replanting, there was proper procedure followed. What's the problem? We don't have FSC paper here. So to cater to them, we fly the paper all the way from the Netherlands sometimes from China, from Indonesia, it defeats the purpose. I have a question for you. So they're asking, no, I have a question how for can you. we do sustainability <laughs> this way? Yeah, so yes. So there's a waste uh, segregation law. And private companies, they're prepared to segregate. What's the problem? What's the problem? The local government, when they collect the trash, they put them together. <laughs> I and tell and you, you it's know, so frustrating. These businessmen, they're very practical. They say, you know, if government thinks, if we take the right approach, we would not have Smoky Mountain. We would have recycling plants. There would be no payatas. We would be thinking of recycling plants, which lead me to my next question Energy Asset Marasigan. Sir, I love sustainability. I love going green. I'm all for renewable energy. But here's the question. Are we punching above our weight when we talk about RE targets? I mean, you think about it, we don't even have, our, our power is expensive as it is. It's hard to attract investors here because it's so expensive. And in an electrician's words, madumi ang kuryente natin. The fluctuations are wild. In Valenzuela City, which is a big area for factories, you know what they require all factories to have? A, a, AV, yeah, automatic voltage regulator, AVRs, just so your machines won't break. Because every machine, expensive machines, can tolerate certain swings in supply demand. But the ones we have are crazy wild swings. And these companies I talk to, they say, you know, we can't even do with AVR. We, we need UPS. We buy the uninterruptible power supply just so we can operate. So the question is, should we even be talking about RE at this point when we can't get the base case correct? Well, that's a very nice question and very difficult to respond. <laughs> well, what we see in terms of electricity, now I'm discarding the issue on the total energy, but electricity alone, we're only looking at the power plant, the generators. But there are always three systems. We have the generation component, the transmission, and the distribution. You said Valenzuela, right? So it's not concerning supply because the other cities are not affected. It also doesn't concern about transmission because the electricity is there. So it's down to the distribution. And maybe the problem would be the distribution facilities the maintenance and operation. And sometimes the common problem is a simple vegetation problem. Very, very basic. But the other problems is that we see some dwellers beneath our transmission facilities. There is already a law that prohibits any infrastructure or structure beneath the power lines. Unfortunately, there are cases that there are dwellings just beneath the, tower, the transmission towers or along the transmission power lines. So there are many instances that we really have to uh, coordinate and we need the support of everybody, including the local government unit. 
and even sometimes the civil society because it's very difficult to address much all of these concerns at, at the same time. But going to the earlier question, shall we push for renewable? Yes, because it's that what we have. We say that it's expensive here in the Philippines in terms of energy supply. Well, it may be, hmm, let's have a look at the entirety of the cost system. We're comparing ourselves with our neighbors in the ASEAN. Look at Thailand, look at Indonesia. They have coal resources, they have gas resources. They power up the system with gas and their own coal. We buy from them. If we buy from them, they have more money to sustain and provide subsidies to their electricity and power services. In our country, we import much of our fossil fuels. 99, almost 99% of our coal supply comes from Indonesia. Well, it's better because we have ASEAN free trade agreement, so somewhat the taxes are reduced, but it's the same thing. We import whatever would be the international prices, it will prevail in our country. Looking deeper into that, how much does it cost us to build a coal thermal facility here in the Philippines compared to in Thailand? Would it be different? I believe it's just the same. But how come the electricity price in Thailand is cheaper than the Philippines? Mainly because Thailand has energy resources like natural gas wherein they get the subsidy. So here in the Philippines, what we should be proud of, it's the true cost that we are paying for. It's the actual generation cost, it's the actual transmission cost, and the actual distribution cost. And at one hand, maybe some of you or very few of you would know, we even provide subsidies in our system. Yes, look at your bills. There is that component on universal charge for missionary electrification. What does that mean? It's very expensive to offer electric power services in off-grid areas like Mindoro in Palawan. So what do we do? We, the on-grid users, subsidize the off-grid areas. We're still paying about 18 centavos per kilowatt hour just for powering up Mindoro and Palawan, which take up more than 72, more than 90% of the 72% of the UCME that are collected for everybody on the grid. Another cross subsidy is we provide a discount for the elderly. Yeah, that's also being paid for by we, the other consumers, who doesn't have the dual citizens yet. <laughs> <laughs> and it's good that uh, there was a move by the national government before that to support the uh, part of the previous loan of the National Power Corporation be sourced from the Malampaya. So that's why one of the components of our stranded costs from the previous operation of our electric power system is being handled or being paid for by the Malambaya Fund or our earnings as government share for the development of our Malambaya natural gas. So it's, a, it's very difficult to compare the energy services in other countries in the Philippines. In fact, in Southeast Asia, there are only two countries that have deregulated power industry. It's Singapore and the Philippines. So, yes, I would like to reiterate that we are paying for the true costs, but the other countries, they are subsidizing their energy sector. Thank you. So, so ASEC, where do we go from here? Yeah, where do we go from here? We lack this. But we have abundant renewable energy resources. So that's the reason why we want, we target 35% and 50% renewable energy contribution in our energy mix by 2030 and 2050, respectively. But the difficulty is how can we achieve that? So we are now preparing all the policies, all the mechanisms that will make us attain the 35% target. For example, we have already issued the 
coal uh, moratorium. So that means we need not look forward to more coal facilities. They're very limited that will be allowed because they were previously allowed. But there are characteristics in terms of power supply coming from our renewables. And without these mechanisms, we cannot move into the entire renewable energy system. For example, yes, we have abundant lands that can be used for solar power, but we may be competing with the agricultural sector in terms of land use. Again, we diverse, we go to the marine lakes. So we are now, we are now promoting uh, floating solar technologies. So address one of the problem, but these facilities are generating only during the daytime. How about the nighttime? Yeah. So we use batteries, you say batteries, but can we have sufficient batteries to support that next 12 hours demand during nighttime? And what is the appropriate time for us to charge the batteries? It should be the daytime. So we have solar. So we have to double our development, our solar power development. One is to charge the batteries and the other one is to generate for power supply. So we have to address this. Ample or more. Again, what would be the necessary mechanism to address that? We put that as part of our energy transition concept. Number one, we don't see the transmission lines from the sea. And transmission line system takes, takes about 10 years to develop. So before we can see the first tower offshore in the country, we have to make sure that the lines will be there. Right? At the same time, where shall we assemble all these offshore wind technologies? We need sufficient forts, dock areas, so that the incoming vehicles delivering all the parts, they can assemble it before deploying offshore. So we need to develop the ports. So maybe somebody will be, why are you developing your ports? You are developing your offshore solar wind. So we have to develop those infrastructure. Now, intermittency of both solar and wind in particular, how shall we manage our system operations? We need to digitalize. We need a smart and grid, green grid system because immediate reaction of these facilities, whether the loss or occurrence, we have to address that. And to efficiently address that, we have to move into the other sector, going digital. That's why I mentioned we're not only supporting, we are adapting. Um, at the same time, what will be the transition fuel that we need? Batteries, we can immediately put it up. One renewable energy that serves the transition or the necessary ancillary for our intermittent REE would be pump hydros. Because pump hydropower development can immediately address, address the ancillary requirement of our intermittent renewable energy resources. But here in the Philippines, how long does a pump storage hydro be developed? It takes us 10 or even 15 years. So does it mean that we have to wait for that 10 to 15 years before we can start developing more of our solar and wind resources? No, we have to find other mechanisms. We have to find transition fuels and adapt technologies. So we look into the coal plant itself. Can we now start innovating our coal thermal facilities? One, can we repurpose it? Can we co-fire coal with other fuel technologies like biomass? They're doing it with mainland? ammonia. Japan is yes, doing it with ammonia. ammonia. We are doing it with ammonia. Yeah. Then moving forward, can we use hydrogen? So where does shall we source hydrogen? Now, our offshore wind resources, based on initial study, will not only power up the Philippines because we have more than sufficient offshore wind resources. What can, be, what can we utilize it for? Well, we can have offshore hydrogen jet production. So everybody, everything in coordination, but we have to set all the policies, all the mechanisms now.
We have one target that is renewable energy, but other targets will come in as the necessary support towards our goal for renewable energy. Going green, definitely 50% by 2050. There you Thank have you. it. All right. Well, we'll hold you to your word, ASEC. Um, speaking of digitalization, I want to go to Dr. Twinkle. And I want to ask the audience here, um, if any one of you is familiar with uh, a province called Tanhua. Tanhua. It's a little province in Vietnam. It's being used as a model uh, province for tourism, digital tourism. This and why should we care about this province? Well, this little province in north central Vietnam just is just about to welcome 12 million visitors this year. And we're not even sure Philippines can hit 4.8 million this year. So the, what this province did was they're trying to digitalize artifacts. Accommodations are all digitally accessible. Every tourist who arrives you know, can use an app, a smartphone, to see to get a 360 view of the place, what to check out. 12 million is not a joke. So I wonder, are we digitalizing to push? Or are we doing the manual, old-fashioned, traditional way of promoting still? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mimi. That's actually a very challenging question. But uh, let me just say that uh, first, um, there are ongoing initiatives to begin with in order to um, you know, digitalize actually the, um, the you know, certain, I mean, different aspects of the customer experience. So if I may use, let's say, the framework of the seamless journey for a traveler, I agree with you that actually the, this transition, the digital and green transition, is very important, not only when the visitor is already here in the country, but more importantly, from the time of procuring that visitor, which means that I agree that there's much more that we can do in, let's say, integrating, um, let's say, gamified marketing um, strategies uh, using mixed um, you know, reality, um, AR, augmented reality, and the like, in order to excite the visitors most especially um, those who have not yet visited the country, the Philippines at all. So this is what we call bona fide or first time travelers, because we've seen in the data that we really are quite good in getting repeat visitors, but we know that the market is still very large out there. So if we're talking about competitiveness, it's really uh, finding ways to enable our enterprises to get a bigger share of the pie out there. But I'm not, talking about just the volume. Um, yes, volume is important, I agree. And I think given what we can offer as a country in this a very beautiful archipelago, we can. There are a number of areas that can still you know, accept the volume. But I think the, the digital and the green transition provides us a very good opportunity to start changing the narrative of tourism development in the country. That with this transition, we can actually get a bigger share of the pie in terms of the revenues or the, the, the receipts and the expenditures. So if going, going back to that framework of seamless journey, so from the time that the, the, the consumer starts to explore you know, places that can be visited, we can already make a very um, a significant impact there through, um, through all these uh, smart and digital applications. And then the journey will reach or the visitor will reach the destination where we need actually integration of transportation services. You know, you get a very good experience at the airport, but then once you want to do multi-destination trips, again, across our beautiful archipelago, then the problem starts to surface. You need sometimes to get out of your accommodation, to buy a ticket for a ferry, to buy a ticket for a bus, you know, um, for a bus trip, land transport and the like. And we see this really happening in a number of our destinations. So I think that that is something where I, the private sector actually can come in to help also find solutions to that. Mm. So that's actually investment. So that's one. 
Now, at the same time, in the destinations, and since we're talking about green transition, we have a number of, um, you, you know, as you said, we have a number of natural resources. We're very blessed with natural endowments, which now allow us to capitalize on our nature-based tourism products. Mm -hmm. And this is an area where we can actually um, ensure that this twin transition becomes a very successful pillar in not just inclusive growth, but in sustainable development. If we can use um, digitalization, in order to make it easy for visitors to enter ecotourism sites, enable them to pay for fees even before they even arrive here in the Philippines or in their destinations, that would be a very, very um, good um, impact. And then on the supply side, if I may just add, um, it, it's not just about making the visitor actually um, satisfied because of that um, journey, but that satisfaction is also derived on how our services are delivered to them. So the uh, upskilling of our tourism workers, the frontliners, and also enabling our enterprises to access raw materials inputs at lower cost because they, are, they have access to what we call shared services. Um, that would be very helpful for them. Because um, if I may just add right now, uh, relate in relation to you know, impacts of climate change, in the Philippines, um, the, the tourism sector, um, con the tourism sector's contribution in terms of carbon emissions to the total carbon emissions of our national economy has increased from about 11.4% in 2012 to already 27.2% in 2019, it just declined about 6.1% in 2021 because of COVID pandemic. But as we try to, you know, as you said, bootstrap and then really recover and bring our performance um, to a higher level, then we would we need to do something about this um, impacts of um, the tourism industry and climate uh, and the climate change or the environment. So that is also another area where this digital transformation is very much needed. And with that, I think we can create value. We can create value not just for the visitors, but most importantly for the host communities because we owe it to them to have this industry being offered and for this industry to generate that very significant economic footprints that we're all enjoying today. All right, um, before we get to a question from Zoom, Dr. Twinkle, from your perch, is there any province that stands out as the most digitally ready for tourists, that is? I cannot really say that there's just one province that offers it all. Um, there's no, let's say, even uh, right now, uh, maybe an enterprise or a destination that offers it all. So most of the destinations actually, I think, are still, you know, learning and are still trying to bring in those investments that would allow them to become, you know, very, I mean, digital and to implement all these green practices. But at the establishment levels, you know, enterprise levels, most especially among the larger companies, we're seeing already the impacts of um, this twin, or this twin uh, digital and um, green transition create already or generate savings for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so all I think right. that's something that we can um, So it's work still on. very fragmented. Yes. The efforts are very fragmented. We can do more and investments are really needed um, for right. this industry. Yeah. All right. Uh, we do have a question from uh, Zoom, from Ronan Lim. How can we make investing in long-term growth and sustainable resources like power more appealing when executives and policymakers are perceived to be concerned only about short-term growth? Uh, a follow-up question would be, could the government consider providing renewable energy directly to customers and compete with service providers like Meralco? So we have a, an unhappy Meralco customer here, but go ahead. Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, well, I would say that the Philippine Energy Plan, we, we now extend up to 20, 2050. It's really a sufficient time for us to really plan what do we intend for the Philippines in terms of the energy sector. So uh, definitely we're working on it. And this is also aligned with the Philippine Development Plan. That's why we, all, we have the administration's plan 
which is coin with a short term plan, but we have also up to 2050, which is which involves the um, long term plans that we have. Now, with regards to that question, whether they can source out their supply yeah. directly from renewable, there are several options actually. Um, number one, if you are a user, a relatively huge user. Let's say your peak demand capacity is about 100 kilowatts. Let's say you have 10, 10 air conditioning system that you run every day regularly. <laughs> then you will have something like 100 kilowatts peak demand per day. Or you have, may have a SME within your uh, properties, then it caters about 100 kilowatts. Yes, you can directly buy renewable energies under the green energy option program wherein there are what we term as retail electricity suppliers that caters only renewables this the bigger picture of this is actually the retail competition and open access but the threshold now for retail competition and open access that involves renewable and conventional is at 500 kilowatts but for renewables, we're now down to 100 kilowatts. Now, the Energy Regulatory Commission has also issued the policy, the rules and regulations pertaining to distributed energy sources. This means these are you putting up your own system. Yes. So you can yes. freely put up your, let's say the easiest one is solar rooftop installations. Yes. So you can easily now put up your solar rooftop installations. If you use, uh, if your installation is just enough for your consumption, but you have a little extra when you go into vacation, then you can enter into a net metering agreement with Miralco. Any excess generation, we will be paid back in terms of uh, uh, the paid back by based on the acquisition, the supply cost of Miralco. So you can... you we can have that already. Yes, we have net metering oh. program already. And oh. we have... A, yeah, I don't know the last count, but uh, Miralco alone is hosting about 5,000 customers, I believe. Like an but, internet of energy sort of thing. Yes. The grid becomes two-way. Yes. I become a consumer and yeah, a producer. You just make use of two meters. <laughs> One right. going in, going out. So then you deduct whichever is more. Right. Then aside from that, uh, the DR now, I mean the distributed energy resources, can also provide for bigger installations. There are business models that are covered by the uh, ERC issue ones, wherein the property owner can lease the rooftop for a power generator. The power generator now can serve the requirements of the owner or they can sell it to the grid. There is also an agree, um, a business model wherein the owner of the property lists the, so, the uh, rooftop. The third party operates and generates the electricity, but solely for the uh, use of the generator of mm -hmm. the property. And the third one is, yeah, we make use of our own generation. So mm -hmm. it's a self-use generation. Mm -hmm. These are already available. Now, going beyond, if you go beyond 5 megawatts, as your peak demand, regular peak demand, you can directly buy from the generators themselves. All right. Um, Attorney Alex, you talk to CEOs every day. What is the sense you're getting from them? Well, Do they sound gung-ho about investing in clean energy, the green transition? Well, certainly, everybody understands. In, in fact, there's data collected by PwC. We need... Uh, investment in batteries 105 times more. So if you're looking for an uh, investment hotspot, you invest in uh, batteries for uh, solar energy or wind energy, uh, for, for instance. I think the uh, CEOs now are more accepting of the fact on, on the, uh, accepting the initiatives on climate change. Of course, the digital transformation uh, went ahead, uh, but they are embracing this uh, uh, more and more, and as I said, the, the issue really now is how do you push this into the supply chain? All right, um, we'd like to encourage everyone to please join the conversation. Uh, we, if, if anyone in the room has questions, please just raise your hand. We would be more than happy to accommodate questions, comments. 
All right, so we have about uh, five more minutes left. So I'm going to throw one more question here, then give you some time to maybe think of your question. But here's my question. Oh, we do have one. Hello. All right. Hi, ma'am. So please identify yourself um, and please direct your question to yeah. the panelists you'd like to ask. I'm, I'm Violet. I'm a social responsibility specialist of Nature Awareness and Conservation NGO. Can I offer a solution to the tourism carbon emission increase? <laughs> Can we do like one tourist, one tree planted solution? per tourist if we yeah, one, want to contribute to ah. decreasing of carbon emissions, especially we can um, get mangrove as a best carbon sequestration, especially those beach goers solution. Or more. Or more. Or <laughs> the birthday uh, tree planting, legacy tree planting, like you plant a tree according to the age you want to live. <laughs> Are you, you know, I where, like that idea. It's a good one. Lower the carbon. So we have this study in Ilocos, um, freshwater mangroves. So actually the mangroves are salt water. So right now we are going to make it freshwater, which is successful, and bring it to the urban area to absorb the urban carbon solutions. Solutions. All right. Uh, Dr. Twinkle. Your thoughts? Um, yes, it's actually one of the solutions. And um, it, just my own perspective is that um, there are different market segments. And of course, um, there are those who go for, let's say, regenerative uh, tourism or who come here, let's say, for volunteers. You have scientists, academicians, volunteers, and the like. Uh, there are specific market segments that would really initially embrace or readily embrace those kinds of solutions. So I think we can start with those kinds of market segments because there are some market segments that may not be readily uh, or that may not have very high level of readiness yet for, uh, let's say, even imposing or mandating those kinds of solutions. But I think we can eventually get there with, uh, with awareness generation. And again, the value creation, if we can really, it's like due diligence from the OECD um, framework of um, due diligence, like know and show. We have to know our um, impacts on the environment and then you know, recognize that um, if we can create, let's say, products uh, that would be uh, sustainable products, then we can show it to the world. And then that's where our different uh, market networks out there can actually help us. And yeah, I think that could be pursued. All right. Uh, we have more. All right. Uh, microphones will approach you. Yes, sir. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, Manuel Trino with the Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department. I'd like to commend the DOE for actually uh, pursuing reforms in the energy sector with the PIRA. But uh, nonetheless, uh, we need to continue reforms under EPIRA and amend EPIRA. There are now proposals to amend EPIRA. Uh, and this proposal should actually focus on one, strengthening regulatory institutions uh, like the ERC and oversight agencies. And of course, power is such a heavily tax, multiple tax industry. Uh, we tax systems loss, even for electricity we're not consuming, you should only tax uh, those which you consume, but we're taxing systems loss. We're taxing capex. We're taxing lifeline rate. And from 2011 to 2021, until ERC suspended, we were actually paying for the franchise tax of the NGCP. Now it's good that ERC is now listening. NGCP has the capacity to pay its franchise tax. We paid 14.9 billion over 10 years by our computations and it's earning. It has the capacity to pay. We have our problem with transmission. We have your trans, uh, tra congestion problems with transmission. We, have, we should have strong oversight over our transmission system. We should pursue retail competition at the lowest level. And of course, 
if we have the strong institutions like ERC, who should have the ability to withstand political pressures in regard to the regulations, good now, they're starting to do it. Uh, so I believe much still needs to be done in regard to continuing reforms in the power sector. And you're right, we are reflecting the true cost because we're not subsidized. And that was the result of EPIRA. Thank you. Thank you for that, sir. Asek, quick comment, or we're just going to count on you to carry on with the reforms. Yeah, thank you very much for, for all those acknowledgement and recognition of what the DOE is doing. Mm. We will continue support for uh, providing the support, particularly the enhancement of the capability and capacity of the Energy Regulatory Commission. Rest assured as well that uh, we are we are consulting our uh, stakeholders in pursuing the different amendments of the Electric Power Industry Reform Act. So again, thank you very much, sir. All right. We had one more question earlier. Yes, sir. Hi. Hello. I'm Mervin Salazar from the Senate Economic Planning Office. I'd like to take off from your conversation about uh, the ease and the cost of accessing the country by the tourists um, from other parts of the world. And the need for integrating the different services uh, in the tourism industry, for instance, transportation, accommodation, and, and uh, other services. And we know for a fact that uh, aside from the ease and the cost problem, there's also the, this problem, the basic problem of the lack of infrastructure in the country, which is a major problem uh, affecting investment. So um, my question, and there's also, you know, uh, going green and uh, digital by, um, by the different industries um, have received resistance, especially from the MSMEs, the small, business, uh, small businesses. And there's a reason, I think, for the resistance, maybe the inability to adopt or the lack of capacity to adopt. Uh, so um, my question is, um, what specific actions would you recommend for government to do and the private sector to do in order to address these challenges? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Who would like to take that? Maybe uh, Dr. Twinkle and Dr. Tan, maybe you can share some perspective. All right. Thank you. Um, yes, I do agree. Actually, infrastructure has been identified as one, if not the main weakness of the Philippine tourism industry. And that's revealed in a number of um, competitiveness uh, ranking reports um, produced by organizations such as the World Economic Forum. And um, in the case of infrastructure, we're, we're dealing actually with two groups. Of course, you have the hard and the soft infrastructure. And in the um, case of the hard infrastructure, we're seeing actually already like uh, modernization expansion of most of the gateway entry points like airports. But we actually um, um, have significant gaps in terms of destination infrastructure. And this is where we need those investments because um, without these investments, let's say in water, sanitation, solid waste management, um, enabling, let's say, communities and establishments to adapt circular economy so that we reduce the waste that we divert to the landfills. If we don't have those kinds of um, investments, we will not enjoy, or our future generations will not enjoy sustainable destinations. So I think that is one area where the government can really focus heavily, um, both national and local governments. We do understand that uh, local government units are oftentimes expected to invest in these types of um, destination infrastructure. But if you look at our um, vulnerability maps of tourism destinations, the poorer or the poorest um, communities and LGUs are the ones that really don't have the funds to invest in these types of infrastructure. And they are the ones that actually have strong potentials to be part of the tourism business. So they need that kind of assistance. And then in the case of um, how MSMEs could actually be, um, be um, you know, enjoy or become 
part of, uh, let's say, all this value chain upgrading. There are three or at least uh, two ways that I could identify. And actually, if you, if uh, there's a work actually done already by uh, Professor Ramonet Serapica, they did a study already on the, um, the, the services sector. Uh, this deals not just with product upgrading, but even process upgrading. I do agree with you. I mean, some owners are not just aware. Second, they're, they're just afraid. They don't know that actually um, going through the verification process will be good for them because there will be safe and secure payment systems later on. So that's just one level. The second is the availability of, uh, for me, shared services because it's costly for each MSME, especially micro, to invest in all these digital applications, softwares, and the like. But if they could access, a, let's say, a common platform that could eventually help reduce the cost on their part as an individual establishment through this regional inclusive innovation centers that I believe that the government agencies such as the DTI is um, investing into or planning to invest into, then that would be a very big help. And you'll be surprised that even owners have to deal with how to even just send email, acknowledge, you know, um, booking uh, uh, requests or queries and the like. So I think that that's an area that could be um, uh, looked into. Thank you. Dr. Twinkle, may I just add, uh, many of the small businesses are hesitant to register to go into the fold, as you say, with government, because some of them, as I spoke to them before, they said, once I register, there's suddenly a target behind at the, on my back. Suddenly, the government will come after me. There are so many regulatory approvals to deal with, so many paperwork. I'm not even making enough at this point, and I'm going to have to pay for so many things. So many of them actually do prefer to stay in the informal sector, for better or worse. So I think the challenge really is ease of doing business for government to convince them that the benefits outweigh some of the challenges of becoming registered. Uh, Dr. Ming Tan, from your perspective. Thank you so much. I think I'll speak more broadly outside, beyond the tourism economy, but I think that the MSME issue has been mentioned many times and you mentioned 71 million across Southeast Asia. So it's really real. And I think one way is, to look at the opportunity of partnering with the private sector to be able to bring MSMEs on board. And here in the digital transformation of MSMEs, um, we can see that happening. Whether you are a small um, food vendor who is able to now market via Facebook, for example, or on Google Business, for example, or on Grab, Shopee or Lazada, it's not a magic bullet, but it's their first step into the digital economy. And then they, the, the platforms recognize it and actually spend a huge amount of resources to be able to onboard these micro, micro and small businesses, especially. The medium ones are originally okay. Um, and, you know, they have small business booster programs, for example, digital literacy programs. And sometimes the the, my, the private sector companies partner with each other as well. So for Grab, for example, they know they have outreach to the drivers, but they don't have a curriculum for digital literacy. So they took Microsoft's digital literacy program, which is very, very good, and then pushed it out in small bite-sized ways. So the same goes for sustainability. And the platform companies, they're not perfect by any, by any means, but what they have is also significant reach both to the companies and to the end customers. So you can either create an incentive on the customer side, getting your food delivered, check the box that doesn't require plastic cutlery. These are really, really small, small efforts. But when you look at the scale, remember I talked about took five days for threads to reach 100 million users. Mm -hmm. When you look at the scale at which these platform companies are working at, that scale really adds up. Every rounding error, when you multiply it, really, really adds up. And um, yeah, so I, I think that bringing the big companies on board, um, make them not part of the problem, but part of the solution, as you know, Attorney mm -hmm. Alex says, is definitely part, you know, one way, one one lever or one tool in a in a big toolbox 
of 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 uh, ways in which that this twin transition can 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 be actually realized. All right, thank you for ending on the partnerships note. How important partnerships are. Um, we're about to wrap. We need to wrap up. The organizers have been calling my attention, um, but just one quick um, final word from everyone. Um, when we're back here in this hall 10 years from now, what do you think are we going to be talking about when it comes to the green and digital transition? Just one word. What are we going to be talking about 10 years from now? It's the same cast of characters. We're all here. What do you think will be the topic then? Just one word, no need to explain. I'll give you 30 seconds. In the meantime, I want to get a pulse of the members here. Where do you think the Philippines is when it comes to the green and digital transition? Are we 80% of the way, 90, 70? If I could get a raise of hands, who thinks we're 90%? National, National the Philippines. 80, 70? Come on, people. 60, 50, 50, 50 is good. Okay, we're seeing hands. 40, 40, 30. Wow, you've, okay, 30. And this is coming from experts who are saying we're 30% of the way. 20, there's one, 10. All right. Lots to think about. That should make everyone here think why we view ourselves this way, what can be done to change it and to move things forward. In the meantime, fast forward 10 years from now, Dr. Ming, what will you be talking to us about? Just one word. Integrated. Integration. Integrated. Dr. Twinkle? Elevation. <laughs> Elevation. Attorney Alex? Quality of life. Quality of life. D Sorry. Director <laughs> Resilience. 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 And ASEC. In energy, AMI, or automotive metering infrastructure. That's a very well, but we'll forgive you for that. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. A round of applause for our panelists this afternoon. All right. So um, we have, since we went over time, we'll still have coffee break, right? Yes. We still have yes. Break. 15 minutes at the Fuller. Fuller Hall. Fuller Hall, just um, right across, um, just beside this room. We'll see you back here at 325 for session four. Thank you.